Good morning, my name's David. I'm curator at All Saints in Wellington with St Catherine's Iton, and it's great to be with you this morning as we see what the Lord might want to say to us through his word. So we're going to read from Matthew 28. We're going to begin at verse 16 and read to the end. So you might want to have your Bibles open in front of you at home. You might want to find them on your phone or your iPad. Um, and it's going to be Matthew 28, 16 to the end. And it says this. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before we see what the Lord might want to say to us, let's pray together. Loving God, this is a well-known piece of scripture to many of us, but we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you might reveal something new of it to our hearts this morning, please. Might we be better disciples might we know our Bible more and know you better and love you more deeply through getting to grips with what it is you're teaching us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I wonder how well you know your films. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, reel off some final lines from some Hollywood well-known blockbusters. and I wonder if you know what they are. You might want to write them in the comment stream. The first one is, so long, partner. So long, partner. Wonder what film that's from. It's from Toy Story 3. What about this one? It was beauty that killed the beast. It was King Kong. I used to hate the water. And then the response is, I can't imagine why. That was Jaws. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, you knew that one, didn't you? Casablanca. And finally, roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. That's back to the future. You see, these final lines from these different films uh, might be etched in our memory. Lots of us will know some of them. I'm sure there are other lines that spring to mind uh, from other films. Or maybe there are slogans that stick in your head. I'm loving it. It's going to be McDonald's. Taste the rainbow. Skittles. That's Asda Price. Asda. <laughs> there are lots of sayings and slogans that we know really well. And I wonder if there's a sense that just looking at those final words in those films stick in our mind. These final words from Matthew's Gospel might stick in our minds so much that we forget maybe the true meaning of what they're all about. These are In Matthew's Gospel, these are Jesus' final words to his disciples. The final line of the film, the finale. I wonder how they will impact our walk with Jesus today. So let's have a look at what this might be teaching us. When the eleven disciples went to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, they saw him and they worshipped him. That's in verse 16 and the first bit of verse 17. They worshipped him. And we need to stop there straight away because we can be fairly sure, based on their names and a smattering of other Bible references, that the disciples were a bunch of good Jewish lads. They'd have grown up learning the Torah. They'd have grown up reciting this phrase over and over again, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They'd have prayed that daily. They said it twice a day. They'd have celebrated Jewish festivals where they remembered the acts of God. In other words, they'd have known that there is one God. 
these good Jewish lads would have known there's one God. He's the creator. He's the God who brought them out of Egypt. He's the God who parted the Red Sea. He's the God that was with them in the wilderness and brought Moses through uh, and the people of Israel to the promised land. They knew the commandments to have no other God before him. And yet, and yet here we have a record by the writer of Matthew's gospel, probably a Jew himself, a bright one at that. He could read and write really well. He was trained in teaching and scribing, maybe. And he records this by using the Greek word proskunio. And it's a word that talks of worship. They worshipped him, of paying homage, of kneeling down before. You know, these disciples would have known what it meant to worship God. And they would have known that by doing this, and Matthew would have known by recording it with this word, that he was saying that these disciples are worshipping Jesus as God. That's what the disciples are doing. And in fact, when we look back at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, we see that the Hebrew word is shaka, which means to worship. And so here we have Matthew, a a Jewish linguistic expert, choosing to use the word worship to describe what the disciples were doing at the feet of Jesus. Remember those lines of the film that just roll off our tongues? We might know this passage so well that we forget what an amazing thing it is that these Jewish disciples are worshipping. Proscunio, they're paying homage before. That word that in the Old Testament is used for God, they're doing that to Jesus. Why? Well, they'd been with Jesus for years. They'd listened to every line that he uttered. They'd puzzled over every parable. They'd marvelled at every miracle. They'd seen him cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. And, and then most of them, at least, fell to their knees and worshipped him. These Jews worshipping Jesus as God, not, not half God, not partly God, not God on a, on a good day, but fully, entirely, totally God. But I love the last half of that verse in verse 17. When we read, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I love it because first of all, it's honest. And I always think this when I see passages like this, people, the people say, oh, the Bible, you know, it was made up. It was a made up book to, to convince people of this made up religion. Well, if I was going to make up a holy book, I wouldn't put in it that at this very moment before Jesus ascends to heaven, that some of his closest followers doubted him. I wouldn't record that. So why did they? Because it's honest. Because it's not just made up and plucked out of nowhere. Because God's word to us is an honest reflection of what it was like. Here we are, you see, we're on a mountaintop moment. The disciples are there, they're with Jesus. They've seen him killed. They've seen him, his spectacular resurrection. He's appeared and popped up all over the place. He's been preaching the kingdom. So I wonder, what do they doubt? What is there to doubt? Who knows? But what I do know is that I doubt as well sometimes. I struggle. And I think we're in good company, my friends, when occasionally we reach a point where we go, what what are you doing, God? Is this really you? What's going on, Lord? I don't understand. God, are, are you there today? Are you awake? <laughs> Maybe it's just me that thinks that sometimes, but I know I'm in good company. Because Jesus' disciples had been with him for, for years and still do all this stuff. They worshipped, but some doubted. And I struggle. I do, you know, when I see what's happening in other places around the world, when a, a leader who says, I'm a Christian, and then says, oh, but I don't need to ask for forgiveness. And many Christians follow him and lord him as, as a great leader. I, I struggle with that. How do I respond? I doubt that God's in there somewhere. God's working, but I know that God is somewhere in that. But I struggle. But I know that I'm not the only one who has struggled. I struggle when I see headlines that that tell me that the richest 85 people across the globe share a combined wealth of one trillion, which is as much as the poorest three and a half billion of the world's 
population. I struggle with that. I say, Lord, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing something dramatic and interceding in that situation? Come on. I struggle. I find it difficult. We're in good company when we worship and then we go, yeah, but but what's that all about? So here we are, my friends, we're with the disciples, we're, we're on a mountaintop moment and their apprenticeship, if you like, is drawing to an end. And one of the focuses in Matthew's gospel is, is the authority of Jesus. If you read Matthew's gospel, that's something that comes out a lot. Matthew's idea of the authority that Jesus had, that it's a sign of his, his holiness, holiness, it's a sign of his anointing and what that authority means. We see him forgiving sins. We see him having the authority to perform miracles. And in chapter 10, um, about 13 chapters before, we see Jesus giving his disciples a portion of this authority, a kind of mini mission, if you like. And then, not 13 chapters, I can't do my math, sorry, 18 chapters before in chapter 10, Jesus does that. And now in chapter 28, He gives all his disciples, all his followers, us included. He knew we were going to read this. (laughs) He gives us this commandment. He says, all authority in heaven and mine, in heaven and earth is mine. What does that mean? So go. It's his authority. We can go in it to make disciples, to baptise and to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's what Jesus says. Make disciples, baptise and teach them because of his authority. I don't know how much authority you feel like you've got this morning. I don't know how strong you're feeling. Who knows? And we're challenged, aren't we, by this passage to to go in the authority of, of Jesus who saw demons flee, who saw the sick healed. We live in a world that desperately needs to know that that Jesus is Lord and that his authority is real. And while we know that we won't see in the full, we won't see the fullness of God's kingdom until the Lord comes back. While we know that not everyone is healed until the Lord comes again, we're still urged to pray boldly. A chap called Smith, uh, not Smith Wigglesworth, sorry, that's not right. Um, A a chap uh, said this when he spoke of healing, it's called John Wimber. He founded the Vineyard Movement and he said, if I don't pray for anyone to get healed, no one gets healed. But when I pray for lots of people to get healed, some people get healed. This kind of now, not yet of the kingdom that we're called to grasp and to pray and to see glimpses of God's kingdom coming. We won't see it in its fullness, but it's coming. We're urged to pray boldly. We're urged to pray with authority. Why? Because we are his disciples. And from a place of being a disciple, where we walk in the footsteps of Jesus, we are challenged to then go and make disciples. Making disciples isn't easy, is it? I can remember um, some friends of ours and they followed a great sermon all about lifestyle evangelism. That's a great way to get people to be Christians with a lifestyle evangelism. That means you live your life as a Christian and invite people to be part of it and, and they notice something's different with you and, and it's a natural way of doing it. So they thought, right, we better witness to Jesus. So what they did is they invited their neighbours to dinner the following Friday night. And when it came to the meal, the the family thought, well, we need to show our friends that we uphold Christian values in our home. So they they asked their five year old to say grace. Little Johnny was a bit shy and he went, "I, I don't know what to say. And there was an awkward pause, followed by a reassuring smile. And and mummy said, well, well, darling, just say what daddy said at the breakfast table this morning. The boy looked a bit puzzled, but he obediently replied and he said, oh, God, we've got those awful neighbours coming to dinner tonight. I hope they don't stay too long. I'm a big fan of Alpha. I'm a big fan of healing on the streets where we go out and pray for people. I'm a big fan of inviting people into our homes and praying with them and loving them. I'm a big fan of knocking on door to door and telling people about Jesus and offering to pray with them. But under all that, I wonder if we're missing a trick, because I think that the secret is that the world is crying out for an authentic faith 
A faith that, just like Matthew says, can doubt sometimes, can worship, fall at the feet of Jesus, and then in the next moment, be struggling and be doubting. A faith that despite the grave robbing authority of Jesus can be tested when we turn on the news and see the latest atrocity. A faith that doesn't see making disciples as a tick in the box or well, let's invite people around to dinner and pray with them so that this happens. It doesn't see making disciples as say the sinner's prayer tick you in but it's an authentic journey with someone. It draws people closer to seeing the face of Jesus with authenticity and openness. So I challenge you as I challenge myself, who is the Lord challenging you to disciple today? Who is the Lord putting on your heart to draw close to, to live authentically with and show them your faith? Because like many things, as we come to a close, we can turn making disciples, I think, into something really complicated. We can make coffee complicated, right? So I googled it and last week there were 21 and a half thousand books on Amazon under the topic of discipleship. On Google there were nearly 60 million websites. That can't be right, I must have got my numbers wrong. Maybe No, 6 million, so I'm not very good with my zeros. 6 million websites providing Bible notes on discipleship. And there were 7 million videos on YouTube teaching you how to pray to be a Christian. Now, there's nothing wrong with all those things. But what we might have there is us making coffee really complicated, when in fact, there's a much simpler way of looking at it. And by doing that, we need to get back to look at what it meant to be a disciple in Jesus' times. There was no set curriculum, there was no timetable, no essays to write, no discipleship course to go on. The disciple would literally live in the rabbi's footsteps. So the rabbi would ask questions of his disciples on a daily basis and the disciples, by watching the rabbi and following his life, would be able to answer. So the focus was not so much on wisdom and how to do things, but it was on living and forming a behaviour that would make you a closer, better follower of the rabbi. There was no formula how to reach the right answer, tick, tick, tick. Tick. Sometimes a disciple would want to be so much like the rabbi that they'd dress identically to them. Sometimes, apparently, they'd even listen to them going to the toilet to try and get to try and be, do the same when they were going to the toilet. That's how much they wanted to emulate uh, their rabbi. So if you were a disciple, for example, in the name of Joe, this meant that you totally surrendered your life to Joe's way of interpreting scripture. So you conformed all your life's behaviours to his interpretations, to what Joe believed, to what Joe stood for. So it's perfectly simple. How to be a disciple of Jesus. It means to emulate Jesus. Easy, right? Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not read six million websites. Let's just get to know Jesus and try and be like him. It's simple, but it's really difficult. You see, we're, we're called to be followers of Jesus who look like him, who speak like him, who act like him with his authority. Do you remember what we said earlier from Matthew's gospel? All the authority that Jesus has. We, have his, as his disciples, are called to live with that authority, speak out with his authority, teach with his passion, love with his tenderness. So this morning, my friends, we're called to worship Jesus, God, Lord of all. We're called to be his disciples, to surrender ourselves to him, to live our life for his standard, to walk in his footsteps. To do what he did, to say what he said, to live like he did, to follow him. After all, in Matthew's gospel, at least, this is Jesus' final words. This is his finale. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. This has ended. This is the mountaintop finish for the disciples. The symbol of a place where you meet with God in scripture is the mountain. And here the disciples are having this mountaintop moment as Jesus is giving them this command. Where he commissions his disciples as he commissions me and he commissions you this morning to go in his authority to make disciples, to baptise, to teach. It's not optional. 
It's not reserved for those people with bits of plastic around their neck or those people that are paid to do it. All of us who are ministers, all of us who are priests, all of us who are followers of Jesus are given this command. Call to worship Jesus despite and with our doubts and our struggles. Call to be his disciple that we might go out and be authentic to others who need to become his disciples. So we're going to have a moment to pray and then we're going to sing a song that talks about this and it ends. Um, it's oh for a thousand tongues to sing and it talks of every tongue singing the praise of Jesus. And it ends with that reminder that we are called to spread through all the earth abroad the wonders, the honours, the glories of his name. We do that to make disciples because we are his disciples. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you make us holy through your Holy Spirit. You bless us with your authority. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Remind us what it is to be your disciple. That we might go out and disciple others. And as we sing this next song, would you put onto our hearts the names of people that you would have us draw alongside authentically, that we might help them become your disciple. We want to go to baptise, to teach and to make disciples. Amen. Speaks at least 